All right, three little packages. Uh, I guess that's the four grab the scissors. Let's open this one. One, two, and scissors. Let's make sure those are a little lower down. I know it's hard to see that there's two of these just because of the way I have them lined up, but I should be able to see pretty easily now. Alright, so let's begin, I guess, with this. This is Pokemon XY Mega 3 movie collection, so this is you know, the movies that compose XY. There was a DVD and a Blu-ray release of this collection, but I think I've only ever gotten these movies on DVD before, so that's why I got the Blu-ray version here. I could be mistaken, but worst case, I guess now I have duplicates of it. Let's see, Pokemon Black and White. Okay. I was wondering what the background there was, and I guess it's a little X and Y-ish. But yeah, pretty straightforward, or at least I kind of expected that. Um, I know y'all are looking at the next title here, but let's actually go with this one first. Now we're going to ship it in, Blu-ray, set one. Which I'm pretty sure none of Ship It In came out on Blu-ray when it came out before. Because I looked and it looked like it was on the movie. I could be mistaken. I feel like I could so easily be mistaken about so many things these days. Naruto was being released on Blu-ray. So here we've got Ship It In, I guess, starting to get its Blu-ray releases. Well, let's go in order. First we've got Boruto. Hmm. Not quite going in yet. I'll worry about that. My Hero Academia. No, I don't. And now that I'm holding this separately from the others, I can tell this is actually supposed to be sort of a bonus art card. A small one. And for our discs. Um, is this a missed opportunity? This is a single kunai. Disc 2 has two kunai. Disc 3 still only has two kunai. Or does it? I don't know. Maybe that's the third one right there. And then the fourth one has four. Okay. The third and the fourth are a little subtle, but good, 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 good. And now, last but not least, the reason I was saving Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.11, thrice upon a time, is because uh, I actually have two copies. This is a Blu-ray one, and this was a 4K HD. I just don't know if this also included Blu-ray. Um, hmm. Order of things, bonuses. Um, Ultra HD feature, Blu-ray feature, bonus features. So this might have Blu-ray discs as well. But yeah, I kind of wanted to open these together so I could uh, figure that out. Because I wasn't quite sure from the advertisements. Okay, yeah, you can actually barely see the title there. Reflecting. Hmm. So I guess let's begin in here. So this one is a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray. This one is just a Region A Blu-ray. This is a special disc Blu-ray. Okay, so I think that confirms if I close this the wrong way. Yeah, apparently so. Wow. 
hard to make out what was in there. It wasn't like super very, very specially obviously worn thing. Bye bye all of these in gallons. So I guess this is a poster of some sort, and then in here, we probably have, oh, it's postcards. That's a, quite a pose. Mostly thinking that she looked a little... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. Uh, the joke I was thinking was that um, there's a Dead by Daylight killer called Skull Merchant, and I like the joke that Skull Merchant has a um, a hip disorder that is why she walks so weird. Hold on, let's get this in here. And you know what? We're not going to end the video there. We'll go ahead and open that so that if y'all um, look at that and say, "Hey, you know what? I'd rather get that limited edition version." Well, now you're very informed. So, what can I say about this? Okay, yeah, there's the region A. And yeah, I'll probably only list the limited edition version in the bottom, but you know, we're still going to take a quick peek at it. Well, uh, yeah. So this is a special disc. And this looks like the actual movie. So it looks like, uh, you know, two of the three discs that are in here are probably the same discs here. And uh, our black ground. So, you know, consider yourselves informed. You know, this one just has the two discs which might have the content you want. You want. But this 4K limited edition version has all the things. Anyways, here's this week's anime Blu-ray collection update. Alright, let's start getting through the long list. One Piece, live action episodes... Uh, I, I was trying to think if I, um, I... I guess I called it the live action episodes for some reason. Season 1, episodes 5 through 6. This is covering uh, most, most of the Sanji introduction. It's a little off, weird. They all are. Um, but I would say that the arc was better than um, the Usopp stuff. Mostly because Usopp has a character. Um, because he says a lot of stuff that are very obvious lies and stuff like that. You know, he's one of those characters that um, doesn't endear himself to me at a fundamental level. So most of my enjoyment of Usopp has been stuff that happens kind of despite all that stuff. But Sanji has had a pretty solid backstory, so much so that they told it again kind of recently in the anime. Um, and their version of telling it here was mostly okay, um, with the two problems being, you know, the, the child actor stuff is weird. Maybe this one was the least wrong of the ones I've seen so far. Maybe wrong feeling would be a better description. It's not necessarily wrong. It just didn't sit correct with me, but this one was probably the least problematic of the three I've seen so far. Um, if there's any problem with the flashback, I would actually say it's also a problem in the future, which is I don't feel like they um, convey the starvation of these characters as well as they did in the anime. And to be fair, it's probably a lot easier to draw somebody haggard and, uh, and malnourished and all that stuff. For this one, I think they would have had to have chosen a kid who naturally looks like that and then maybe added some um, makeup and padding and stuff so that he looks a little bit more well off, I suppose. Maybe. But it's it's not just the kid one. Also, the pirate that gets fed by Sanji um, in the present is, I don't know, weirdly introduced, played in a way that was like, I guess you're supposed to be starving. I guess I don't feel it as much as I did in the anime version. But that weirdness aside... Um, it's interesting and it's at least feeling like it's keeping up with the same sort of presentation as the rest of the show so chances are if all you've watched is the live action One Piece you're probably enjoying it just fine I think 
Oh, uh, unless, you know, there's just something very basic about it you don't like. Um, maybe this is one of the least convincing changes so far, which is... Why was Luffy able to basically leave at the end of episode 6? I felt like in the anime it was a little more convincing because it's like, okay, yeah, he, he did a great favor to someone, I thought. As well as being an inspiration. And this Luffy still feels kind of inspirational and very supportive of people's dreams. It's strange how some of it works. His battling did use his devil fruit power quite a bit more in this one compared to previous ones, which is a little bit better. But I guess you don't feel that overwhelming power of the devil fruit power, even if his abilities sound simple in practice. And, it, you know, it kind of makes sense. It's it's the same reason why um, War of Noro Zoro's uh, Three Sword style doesn't feel that interesting. Like, it, it was kind of a hard sell in the first place in the anime, but they had him doing stuff with it a lot. But when it comes to, okay, we're going to choreograph sword fights, I don't think they really know what to do with Three Swords. Hard to blame them. I'm not sure how I would make Three Sword style look um, convincing in live action. And even the anime doesn't feel like it does it anywhere near as much. But, you know, overall, it's been enjoyable. One thing I can say for certain is getting to see Buggy the Clown every once in a while. He's actually very fun to see on screen. He's, he's definitely my favorite character in this live action um, version of One Piece. So, if me and my friend keep up our pace, hopefully this coming Friday we uh, finish uh, the live-action version, because I do believe it's only eight episodes. And I think I've got a good feeling for where it's going to end. It's introduced, I think, more future-facing stuff, stuff that you discover hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes into the series. I'm not sure if it's necessarily the best introduced compared to that, but in terms of trying to compress a timeline and tell some of the ideas and explore some of the ideas in live action a little better, it's uh, been okay. Uh, but we're going to have to see if it handles a season finale pretty well, and that'll be interesting. Because I know that w One Piece sometimes has okay finales to big stories, and sometimes it has mega fucking spectacular stuff that's just like, oh yeah, this is... I'm going to watch this show. This is probably what, um, you know keeps us hooked, even though, according to my friend, I think we've been watching it for over ten years. Is that right? Um, maybe I'm not remembering the date he said first right, because I was just thinking that I've been living in this apartment complex for... 11, 12 years? No. Anyways, fun stuff. Hulk, episode 15. Um, it's continuing to tell this backstory, this important backstory related to all this stuff stuff. Um, and it's okay. I, I guess, if anything, it's like... I, I was kind of thinking it would get to kind of the point sooner. And it doesn't feel like it's necessarily wasting our time. It's just, you know, okay, I guess there's a lot more story it's telling back here than I would have guessed. But it's okay. The Saint's Magic Power is Omnipotent, Season 2, Episode 3. What specifically happened in this one? Ah, that's right. I was completely blanking on that earlier today as well. Not that there was nothing that happened. But I'm kind of blanking. What can I say about my feelings? I guess they've introduced... They introduced some interesting stuff at the end of um, Season 2, Episode 2. I, I really enjoyed some of that. For Episode 3... Hmm. I guess... Some of that conversation, that conversation... Dances. You know, maybe that was it. Maybe there wasn't anything big that happened story-wise, and this time... It was just kind of reminiscing in its shoujo aspects of quite a bit more. Which is fine. People who are into the show for that would probably enjoy that. 
Eminence in Shadow, Season 2, Episode 23. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure what the previous episode had left us off with. This one revealed a couple of interesting pieces of information and some neat stuff that happened. I wouldn't call it the strongest story arc in Eminence and Shadow, but it might also not be done. It's really hard to say. Because if it did do a thing in three episodes, then it's done. But it, there, are, there were moments where things were longer than three episodes in the original season one that did build up to something really cool. And I guess I'm kind of curious to see where it's going to go. But again, there were some interesting revelations about the world. I'm giving the disgrace, Noble Lady I Rescue, a Crash Course in Naughtiness, episode three. I guess it was entertaining enough. Um, trying to think if we got any really big developments in there. And I can't think not. It probably means that you might be able to tell from episode one if you're going to enjoy it. So it might be a good one or two episode anime. So you maybe don't need to give it the three episodes. And if you don't like it in, after two episodes, well, maybe uh, episode three is an indication that you may not continue enjoying it. I don't know. Uh, my daughter left the nest and returned an S rank adventure, episode four. I like this episode. Oh yes, yes, yes. That happened. And that was very nice. There, there was some touching moments in it. Um, I I liked the interact. Direct <laughs> I liked the interaction between a lot of the characters. There was some interesting stuff set up where it's just like, oh, I didn't realize that. And it's like, oh. They're going to make this a potentially big deal. Well, how are they going to handle that? And they handled it in a surprisingly touching way. I also really like the fact that, you know, she's an S-Rake adventurer. He, he retired as an E-Rake adventurer after he lost his leg. But it is sort of establishing that even though that was a situation, he's probably better at it than he thinks. Like, I'm not sure if he's S rank, but he's definitely feeling like there's definitely more to him than he knows, which is really neat because it means that when he interacted with his daughter, they were able to do more, more with that dynamic than I would have expected. And I would, just, I would say this was a really touching episode just overall. Both their interaction, the interaction between the other characters, just... Actually, a really sweet episode. Really liked it. Dr. Stone, Season 3, Episode 13. Fun stuff, I believe. Oh, yeah. That's why they called it that. Not sure what, I, what all I want to say about it, because... Is there stuff I would want to spoil or not? But it was nice. And it definitely gave a lot more for you to think about in terms of the series overall. But, of course, we're still kind of stuck in the series where it currently is. Things feel like they're off to a really interesting, maybe not climax, but interesting confrontation. But I guess we'll, we'll have to see what it's going to do. Nah, it's, it's just been fun so far. Uh, Verona Kenshin, 2023, episode 16. Uh, it's okay. Very watchable, I would say. I just don't know if I have much else to think about it. Other than the fact that, okay, I can see why they made this into the shonen. I think it was a shonen show that was aired in the 90s. Uh, some of the material just definitely feels like it, but the execution continues to feel better, I guess. Slightly above that, like maybe there's a slight message to some of the... Camp isn't the right word, but it's definitely something that feels reminiscent of that. Maybe... Maybe there's some stock villainry that goes on in this show, I think. But it, this version of it is okay enough that it doesn't feel like it's as 90s shonen-y as, I guess, um, the original show was. Which, you know, it was 90s shonen. what you'd expect. 
Uh, the Rising of the Shield Hero, Season 3, Episode 3. I'm trying to think if I would say if there's anything about this episode that made me say, okay, yes, I feel like something incredible happened, but I feel like it's still building up and setting up and doing entertaining stuff. So far, nothing bad like Season 2. Like, again, the big problems with Season 2 are, okay, there's this bad guy, and I don't feel like I agree. Oh, yes, he's the bad guy that just knows stuff, so he can just do this. I don't feel it's like it's done anything that bad, or, oh, let's take our main characters and just, you know, cheat on them a little bit to see if we can get the audience fake invested. And also, none of the hurry from Season 2. So it's just... Doing it's okay stuff. It's tricky because, you know, season two may have started off feeling a little strange, but at least it felt okay until it just started, you know, rolling downhill at some point. So I do feel like season three, we really won't be able to tell until season three is done if it feels that way. Now, granted, about the halfway point, we'll probably say, okay, it at least isn't feeling as bad as season two. And it's hard to think of anything else about it. You know, like, I guess I'm waiting. It's entertaining enough. Characters are nice. Characters in Season 2 are nice. They were just... I don't know. Part of the story that wasn't quite executed quite right. Goblin Slayer, Season 2, Episode 3. Um, after Episode 2's very... somber, realistic... Oh, yes, if anything were to get under Goblin Slayer's skin and bother him, that was a real moment for that. This one, I guess nothing big happened in it except near the very end. But I guess it's a setup for the next episode. But this one is kind of a, you know, I guess building up certain stuff and it's mostly not like building up our main main characters so much as it's like a lot of the entertaining side characters that we've seen are being built up, and it's, I'd say it's being done in a way that's entertaining enough. Heard a weird sound in the kitchen. I don't know what that was. The Kingdoms of Ruin, Episode 3. Um, I go back into this, and some of those negative thoughts I had last time, I'm like, yeah, fuck them all. Fuck them. Destroy every last one of them. I don't care what any of the goody two-shoes say. Fuck them all. Yeah, so, in that regard, you know, it's keeping some of that good desire for revenge energy, but I guess a lot of episode 3 seem to be spent maybe partially building up some ideas of the world, maybe partially um, setting things up so that the anime could break off of this vicious revenge hatred it's building in the audience, and we'll have to see what episode 4 does. It's entertaining enough, just stuff. Uh, for your end, Beyond Journey's End, Episode 7. I'm trying to think of everything that happened in here. Because I know near the end of it, it's definitely setting something big up to happen in the next episode. And some of the stuff that it went over when it was setting that up was interesting. So it's continuing to be a, quite a nice series to watch. I'm not sure what else I can specifically say about it. It's definitely got its calm moments, but at the same time, you know, it's building up and doing interesting things. And I don't know how much I want to comment about certain things, because I want them, I want, if you watch the episode, I want you to kind of build the understanding that it wants you to build as you go along. Ragnar Crimson, episode four, entertaining enough. Um, I guess if there's anything about it that I'm not quite as sure about, it's there's certain interactions I would still want to see happen. But what it's doing with the stuff it's set up is interesting. I guess, again, because it's one of those sent back in time sort of stories, we kind of know what a forward direction looks like, and it looks entertaining enough. Like, 
okay, yeah, I guess I know the four direction. It, it seems kind of like One Piece where it's kind of hard to tell how far they are from an actual final destination or if they've actually set that up. But, or if they've tried to give us hints about, oh, this is how we would know. Like, they didn't say, okay, here's the ten seats of the something-something and the tenth seat was dis destroyed and now they have nine more to go or anything like that. But I'm kind of glad they're not doing that. As it is, it's... Or did they not set that up? Maybe they did say something. I don't know. I feel like it's also throwing a bunch of random stuff at us, but it feels like it's at least random stuff that's cohesively aimed in the right direction. So I kind of, whenever I'm watching it, have a good feeling what it's doing as it continues to go along. Why it's doing stuff as it continues to go along. Hmm... Anyways, the next one is actually a surprising one. The Vexations of a Shut-In Vampire Princess, Episode 3. Um, this episode, if we're playing by the three-episode rule, may actually be suggesting this is a good show to watch. Which is very surprising, because, you know, if you're like me, then the first two episodes are kind of like, that's some kind of funny whimsy I'm not a big fan of. Oh, she has to pretend to be powerful, but she's really weak. It, it, the living based on a lie. I mean, it's why I had trouble watching Usopp, right? Except, you know, that sort of thing's made into the show itself. Anyways, um, the interesting point is that episode three here actually gave us some more interesting setups, interesting character dynamics, interesting character histories to make us say, now wait just a fucking moment, show. Now I actually care. What the hell are you doing? So, if you watch the first two episodes and you're still waffling, definitely give the third episode a try. It may surprise you. If you watch the third episode and you still don't care about it, that's fair. Or at least I think that's fair. I'll have to watch the rest of it at this point because it's like, now I'm kind of curious. Maybe it's not going to lean too much on that, um living a life of lies thing. But we'll have to see. The Faraway Paladin, Season 2, Episode 3. I really liked this episode. Um, I really liked how dwarfy the dwarfs felt. And the new dwarf character, who seems to be the dwarf version of our main character's elf friend, you know, it feels like that. I really like him. He's kind of refreshing and different, but still feeling very dwarf-like. It's... I just kind of appreciated it as a whole. I'm, I'm not sure how much more I can really describe about it. I just really liked the character that they introduced. And I, I definitely want to see where they're going with it, because... Well, because I feel like our main character is going to bring good things out of him. Uh, next up... Butareba, the story of a man turned into a pig, episode 3. Uh, let's see, I guess. Okay. Yeah, if they're going for the 3 episode thing, they at least wanted to end episode 3 on a cliffhanger to make you say, well, now I want to see what happens next. But it did some stuff. It, it's still one of those shows where it feels a little strange about, um... certain people choosing to do certain things or something like that. But I guess it doesn't feel horrible. It just sort of feels like this could be a show that would easily make people lose their grasp. So the fact that they, in episode three, pulled off something, you know, just to keep you a little enticed at the end of the episode to maybe go on to episode four, that could be very intentional, and maybe the show gets better and better as it goes. Maybe it maintains okay quality as what it has. But there's definitely a little bit of a risk of feeling like nothing is keeping you attached to the show, per se. It doesn't feel like it's grown out of that by episode 3, per se. I Shall Survive Using Potions, episode 3. I'm really quite surprised how much this show likes to change its um, status quo. I'm wondering if we're going to see that sort of fall apart to a certain degree. But it's like, it's interesting because our main character, it, the, sh the show executes things really weird. And at the same time, I mentioned that some of the philosoph 
philosophical stuff that they talked about last time. Well, some of the basic idea is fine, but the execution, the explanation, the acceptability, etc. I feel like that's just still here. I, I think you can tell from the first episode that this show is going to be kind of like that, so... You know, it, it is what it is. It's being okay. I, again, it's somehow, even though it's got these weird trappings in it, it's still refreshing. But it's really hard for me to put my finger on exactly why it works for me. And I don't think it works very strongly. Maybe just a little bit. So make of that what y'all want. Um, Tear Moon Empire Episode 3. Uh, this is continuing that kind of resurrected as a villainous sort of trope. So it, it's been playing those tropes where the character's like doing something not necessarily that they believe to be villainous but something that I don't know because they happen to do it it's the perfect thing and just like Shoujo is sort of like this which is usually those reborn as the villainous um, shows um, it's making it's tending to make things better and it's entertaining enough Hmm. Is there anything I can really comment on relating to the trappings, the happenings? And I'm not sure. But entertaining enough, I guess. But it it's definitely feeling a little bit more of that Shoujo reincarnated as a villainous vibe. But unlike uh, the previous series and so on that I watched, it's at least feeling like it's keeping some of those reminders of the darker thread that it's about you know our main characters um previous experience with um being jailed and mistreated and jailed and then killed at the guillotine you know that's kind of a dark thing to kind of keep carrying around but the show keeps not overusing it i feel maybe it, i don't know if they're underusing it but at least it's still watchable spy family episode 28 uh, good to get some more of Uncle Yuri. I think that was his name. It's hard for me to remember because I think two different characters called him by two different names. Probably because one of them was talk calling him by his family name and the other was calling him by his um, given name. But most of the episode was that. And then there was just a little bit of sprinkling of a whole lot of other little fun things. So even though it looked like the episode had four names, it was really one name and then a you know, just an introduction of a handful of other interesting things. Um, they were amusing. Stuff was amusing. Uh, although, once again, it's another episode that doesn't feel like it's really about um, anything big happening. Which is fine. It's just a question of, you know, does it stay entertaining? And I think it stays entertaining. Uh, a Returner's Magic Should Be Special, Episode 3. Let's see. I guess it's continuing to be okay. Kind of entertaining, kind of doing stuff here and there. I'm not entirely convinced that person is a boy, though. And it isn't because they are a very effeminate, drawn boy. And the voice actor is one of those female actresses, voice actresses, who would be playing a, a femboy kind of character. But it's more that the subtle interactions and the ending credits kind of make me think, I guess our main character might just have a harem of three girls. But I guess we'll have to see. I'm not sure if that's super, super important, because otherwise it's about setting up some more interesting stuff where he knew he would be in the beta class no matter what but that's fine because he knows that there's a lot of diamonds in the rough there that he needs to make sure they're better prepared and so he's done that with a handful of people and talked to people here and there and done some interesting mysterious stuff so it's been entertaining enough I just feel like by episode 3 maybe we should be having a better feeling for what kind of show long term this is and maybe we do Maybe that feeling is a little weak, but 
I guess it's okay. Berserk of Gluttony, episode four. Um, I guess it's also okay stuff. I think there's a problem with it where we kind of know the direction it's going to go, but it doesn't seem very consistent with making that kind of the interesting focal point. And I guess that just doesn't work a little bit simply because it's focusing on parts of the show that feel like, oh, the show's just giving our main character stuff for free. And it's not as exciting when that happens. It's not necessarily bad. You know, it certainly sounds bad when I put it that way, but I guess it's just more one of those shows that I could very easily see maybe struggling to keep certain attentions, but not necessarily bad, bad. We'll, we'll have to see how it goes as a whole series. I could probably still watch it because Sundays are relatively light. Shangri-La Frontier, episode four. It's stuff? Okay, yeah, so they established some of this some of the interesting stuff that was happening at the end of the previous episode, but where it's going to go from here, it's hard to really say, especially since it's trying to introduce the idea of more characters being aware of our main character choosing to play this game. But the problem with that, the reason why it doesn't work so well for me here four episodes in is because they had already established that with at least one character, but they've never really done any interactions between our main characters and the others so it's just sort of like I don't know he's just one person playing a video game but it's a video game they get to kind of make up on the fly so I so I guess it's just uh, it doesn't feel like there's a narrative depth to it but I wouldn't say that there isn't necessarily no narrative depth I would, again I would put the emphasis on it sort of feels like uh, I'll continue watching more to find out. The 100 Girlfriends Who Really, 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 Really Love You, Episode 3. Um, sorry, it, this show's a hard one to digest just because there's a big problem that it always has to deal with, and that's the fact that the fundamental premise shouldn't work and the first two episodes kind of made it work by kind of just more having fun with it as opposed to just saying, now audience, do you want some girls? Do you want 100 girlfriends who really, 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 really love you? You know, it doesn't feel like that. It feels like it's actually playing with stuff. So to a certain degree, it could be seen as doing a good job of playing with its tropes. In some regards, that kind of makes it similar to The World God Only Knows, but that one kind of had reset buttons in order to allow that one to continue to play with that one over a longer period of time, whereas this one is definitely moving quite a bit faster. But it was still a touching little story where if um, the fundamental premise wasn't there, it would have been actually just fine and neat on its own. And then the question is, okay, well, how did they integrate that with the main premise? And surprisingly, it worked out. I'm not quite sure what I want to say about why it worked out, but Let's just say I'm surprised that it did and fine that it did and find the way it happened. Again, one big problem I have with it is it would be a lot more honest if he told these girls, oh yes, by the way, the love god told me that he accidentally gave me a hundred um, um, soulmates. So there's going to be 97 more people eventually. I was just thinking it'd be really interesting if the AA show went on for a long time and, you know, like he met his 100th one when he was kind of old and in a nursing hospital or something like that. I don't know, there's something about that that sounds like wasted love, but at the same time it also sounds like very touching love. I guess you could, it really depends on how they portray it. Dark Gathering, episode 16. I guess it's an okay in between. Two big things episode. But I'm not quite sure what it was setting up at the end there. Hmm, interesting. But for the most part, um, like I said, one, one issue I kind of have with it is sometimes it feels like the ghosts are a little too interacting with another person y, sort of. I don't think this one had a whole lot of it because it was more characters reflecting on events. But I guess in that regard, it works fine. 
but I'd say only fine. The Demon Sword Master of Excalibur Academy, Episode 4. Okay episode, I suppose. More of a kind of transitionary episode where I guess I revealed something at the end of the previous episode. In this episode, nothing too big happens, but I guess they're setting up for whatever's going to happen in the next episode. Which is okay, I guess. If anything, it just means the show is... It doesn't feel like it's necessarily about our main characters doing anything just yet. It's, it sort of feels like they're just sort of there for the show to show us, oh, they're doing stuff. It's it's not ex as bad as saying that, but again... And, you know, you can take all, all these reviews of anime with a huge grain of salt and say, Giga Frost is just watching 27 series at the same time. He's not going to stay as invested in them as he might if it was just them on the low. And maybe that's possible. But, a playthrough of a certain dude's VR MMO life, episode 4, you know, this one continues to not feel like it's having, it has any real destination. Just, oh, well, he's our character just doing stuff. Which, I guess, is improving him in ways that may be interesting. This one didn't show us maybe the full extent of that. It probably set something up, and I guess we'll find out in the next episode. I do worry a little bit about whether or not this show is a little too... Well, let's just give our main character something that's nice, easy, and convenient for them. I don't feel it's as bad as, like, say, what was another one I was thinking about that was like that? I'm not sure. Maybe Berserk of Gluttony? But at the same time, it do it also doesn't have as much of a four-direction pull as it, per se, so it's a show that's watchable. If I were to personally rate it, I would actually rate it um, more. It it's keeping me more curious and interested than... Um, I'm stuck at level one with an OP skill or so, whatever that one was from the last season. I'm not sure if that's a good valid thing, but I, I guess I was just kind of thinking that I can sort of feel a slightly similar vibe in terms of, you know, things are convenient for the main character, but I do feel like certain dude's VR MMO life doesn't feel like it's giving out as many hands out, handouts, so it's not that crazy. Rowan... Kamonohashi's Forbidden Deductions, Episode 4. Um, I was a bit worried about how the introduction of secret society shit was going to be, and I'd say they actually handled it pretty well. It's definitely got me a little bit curious in terms of what the show's going to do, and it not, like, abandoning some of the, oh, the, that's an interesting observation, oh, that's an interesting observation, oh, that's an interesting observation. You know, that, that sort of stuff that's kind of fun in watching a deduction show. So I feel like it's still going to be having that as it goes episode to episode. It's not too distracted by that other stuff, which I consider to be an overall good thing. So I, I feel a little promise for this show. Uh, Dead Mount Death Play, episode 15. What all happened in this? I guess certain interesting things happen, certain character moments, stuff like that. If there's anything I would say that felt a little disappointing about the episode, it's that because they've introduced such a wide variety of characters and stuff, it almost feels like they can't complete thoughts anymore because a complete th completed thought happened... Well, a thought started regarding an interaction between those characters, but they never completed it in this episode and instead seemed to transition between another one. Which is all interesting enough stuff, but, um, I don't know. I, I guess it feels me a little hungry to see if they would have talked about that other stuff. If they, if, if it would have been neater if they focused on the other stuff. We'll have to see where the series actually goes from here. But, interesting enough stuff. Alright, so do I have anything else to talk about? I don't think so. Dead by Daylight event, Halloween event has been happening, and it's neat. Um... It definitely looks very neat. You know, I, I had fun playing around with this stuff. I, I did mostly killer because you could do almost everything as killer. And when you're the killer role, you kind of get to set the tone a little bit better and say, Oh, yeah, well, you don't want me to attack you. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I don't need to attack you. I Like, literally, the only challenge I have right now is sacrifice... Oh, no, it's hook three survivors during the endgame collapse. But I don't have it selected in order to actually do it. I have it selected in case somebody's like 
thank you for playing Hook Me on the Hook, I will be like, yeah, okay, sure. But beyond that, I did spend enough time as Survivor to kind of complete both the first page, the first page of both the Event Tome and the current Rift Tome. I guess both pages come out soon, so that'll be that. But otherwise, I actually spent most of last week kind of exhausted. I do wonder if there's a bit of a weather thing that came in, but I got the impression that that might have only did things over the weekend, because I think a lot of people got hit over the weekend by strange things, and I don't know if it's still visible, but my uh, left eye here was uh, red and bloodshot. I had a pretty bad migraine, and I had to take some ibuprofen this morning, which I doubt the ibuprofen is lasting until now, so that probably just helped get its edge off, and you've probably seen me, like, closing my eyes and stuff, and there's still an exhaustion there, but either the migraine was caused by, maybe there was something in the air, maybe it was just eye strain time at the wrong, wrong time, um, maybe there could have been something else. If I were to take a guess, it's probably a combination of something in the air and too much eye strain, and then the eyes just like, fuck it, I can't handle this. But it, it was kind of an intense end to a PTO where I just felt like I was kind of restless the whole time couldn't completely sleep and completely relax and so it was just annoying. The next PTO which is next week is going to be more interesting because I've got a temporary crown here and uh, November 1st I'm going into the dentist to get permanent in and yes I've had one crown put in over here too so yeah I, I, I know it's not going to be pleasant at all. I mean saying it's not going to be pleasant is understating it's for those of you that don't know when so the crowning of a tooth is basically they can't do fillings because the fillings would just be too big and it would be there wouldn't be enough tooth for the filling to mostly be tooth so it becomes easier for the filling to come out it's not as reliable things could get in a lot more easily so at that point they um, sometimes crown you which uh, they basically take the whole top of the tooth off like not not down to the roots but maybe like the top and they leave a stub on the top that's almost like the um, part of the tooth above the gums, and that's the only part that remains. And the reason there's a temp crown, permanent crown, is temp crown, they can put something in there that kind of mostly works, and uh, you know, if this were my permanent crown, probably kind of mostly work just fine. But they're going for something, I think, made out of a more um, robust material. And, um, you know, they, they do a much more careful scan of that one. So this one, they kind of construct it on the spot. But, you know, they took scans of the mouth with, like, a LiDAR or something to get the 3D scan so that they could build a tooth to put it there. You know, but they'll probably still have to whittle it down and get it adjusted just right and stuff. But they'll use a stronger glue, and it'll be a stronger thing. But the reason it's painful, the reason it's stuff... If you thought, like, fillings and stuff are painful, the reason the crown is bad is because when they put that permanent tooth in, they um, they don't want to use anesthetic because they want you to have a very good feel of the tooth as they're finishing putting it in. And, you know, th this is probably also why they do it in a two-step process because the two-step process means that they can completely numb you, put you down, whatever, to take apart the one tooth and put another thing in its place. But when it comes to putting the permanent crown in place... You know, they no longer have to break it down, but they still need to, like, clean it and stuff. And if you've ever felt your teeth being really sensitive to, like, a drink or something like that, that's basically what it is, except that you can't stop it. And so it's... It, it can be excruciating, so, you know, I have that to look forward to next week. But, uh... Oh, well, at least I'll have a lot of anime to watch to make up for it. Hmm. I wonder if there's anything else for me to really talk about other than love playing Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, play it with my brothers. Y'all should give it a shot too if you have the Nintendo Switch Online uh, expansion pass. But I guess I'll end things there. Y'all, have a nice week.